There we go. Good. And to, if you're uh, joining us online, welcome to you out there in internet land. I don't know what to call it, but um, you're certainly, we're glad you're part of us as well. I am going to be in the book of Philemon today. I'll send you on a little scavenger hunt. Um, little tiny book um, just after Timothy and Titus. And I won't give a long speech about it. I decided not to put this on slides. So I will be reading the entire book today and next week. We'll talk more about actions and and character today, but next week I will focus, well, you know, some motives. It kind of all blends in, but next week is communion, and, and I think it will fit very well in remembering our Lord's death and um, just some thoughts in the, in the pictures that, that we can draw from this little book. I asked Buck today, he, he did say he has referenced it occasionally um, in speaking. Um, would anybody in this room say, I've got part of Philemon memorized? <laughs> I don't either. I mean, it's just not, it's such a little book and we don't think a lot about it. Uh, it's not referenced a lot in sermons, but it has this very important message of forgiveness within it. So that's what really what we're talking about. And, you know, for the things that go onto the website and all that, um, I do a title of this sermon is Three for God. Because I'm going to focus on a guy named Onesimus, Philemon, and of course Paul. But they're all, um, well, I'll explain that as I go here. Let's pray for a moment. Father, thank you for wisdom from your word and for the good father that you are. You have a shepherd's heart and that is so important to us because we need in different ways. It's so easy sometimes in these communities in this country to feel self-sufficient, but we are not and you are. And so we thank you for loving us and, and your patience and grace with us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So I'm going to talk for a moment about the book of Jonah. Remember that? Oh, the, when God prepares a big fish, and it's a, you know, was a great Sunday school story. I get into my adulthood, and I think about Jonah, and the more I think about Jonah, and the more I look at Jonah, the more frustrated I get with the book. Jonah's attitude really never comes out of the weeds. Uh, there's no conclusion. And you go to teach that, and it's like, there's no conclusion. What am I supposed to tell people? Well, you know what? As time goes on, I'm realizing I'm a lot like Peter. I, when Jesus came out on the water, Peter gets his eyes off Christ, and what happens to him? He, he sinks, right? He puts his eyes on the waves. The the important message in the book is not Jonah. I, I start looking at God and I'm thinking he's faithful and patient and, and consistent through the entire book. This, this book isn't so bad. And then I think more about the people of Nineveh, Nineveh this, this massive city that God... Um, decides, you know, they repent and he lets them, God lets them um, live on where he was going to destroy them, remember? And they're down in the dirt in, in sackcloth and ash saying maybe if we show God we're serious about repenting, he will not destroy us. Because they knew who God was and they understood his power and I'm thinking, the more I consider the book of Jonah, that, that's, that's me. I'm a Ninevite in a way. I've never sat in the dust, literally, in sackcloth, sackcloth and ash, but I came to a point where I realized what Ephesians says, that I am dead in my sins. 
I don't even deserve to be on God's church basketball team, let alone be led into heaven for eternity. But he, but he loved me anyway. And I'm a new creation in him. I, I've said this before. I'll never get tired of saying it. Don't ever <coughs> fall into that trap where people say, why doesn't God do miracles anymore? You're looking at one. I'm telling you. And that's the real beauty in the book of Jonah. And I think it, it is in Philemon too. It's, got, it's a little book. It's got a na- guy's name on it. But Philemon's not the big point to this. God is. And God's love. I will read through it, and then we'll, I'll kind of highlight maybe a couple things as we go. It's a very short book, as I said. Philemon is a leader in a church. They met in home churches. Um, it's going to be 300 years before people start meeting in buildings. Um, and remember, for a lot of that period, Christians were outlaws, and they suffered terrible persecution. You can read about that, some of that kind of thing in he- the book of Hebrews, what they faced just for being faithful people to God. So these people meet in a home church, and that went on for a, a long time, and there were a number of these churches This is a man of means because he's got a home big enough to do that and he's he's a slave owner. And so he's he's not um, just an employee somewhere probably. Let's read Philemon. By the way, there are Bibles on the back table if you need one, but if you have it on a a phone or whatever uh, you do, I'm going to read from NIV, but I think it'll be easy to follow in other versions. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. He knows this guy. Also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, probably his family, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll talk more about some of that as we talk about the three main characters. Verse 4, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. I start right away to think about the character of, the, of forgiveness. This is couched in a deep-seated faith. And, and in, as I've said many times from this very lectern, if you don't dig deep wells with God in life and your relationship to him, when the storms come, when things are expected of you that are otherworldly, you'll find it difficult to get there. This is not the case here. And Paul's introduction is very, very promising for the, you know, what we're going to read as we move on. Verse 8. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you what you ought to do. Yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. Onesimus was a slave belonging to Philemon, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, The name Onesimus means useful. It's a Greek name. But now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent. 
so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. You can see the value that Paul is placing on this person, Onesimus. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. Sometimes he would have had, well, he's going to mention some people at the end. They, they would write letters for him, especially with age and eyes. Verse 19 at the last there, I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. Evidently, he introduced Jesus Christ to Philemon. And there is that between them as well. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So that's the letter. It's the shortest letter of Paul's that we have that has survived anyway. Couched in these books like Hebrews and Timothy and these, you know, these powerful doctrinal statements for God, here's this little letter. And it strikes me that although it's meant to be read to the home church, and Paul is probably completely aware that it's going to be circulated beyond that, that God, as he writes these and, and pens through the Spirit and through these men, these big, powerful doctrinal statements in these books can also become very personal. And he can reach out and he can touch two lives and three lives and make himself known in very important ways. And this book is a, is a reminder for me of, the, of that very thing. So let's... Let's talk about Onesimus a little bit. He's the slave. Uh, he's run away. Where does he meet Paul? I, you re we really don't know. A lot of people would say Rome because Paul had freedom in Rome while he was on house arrest. And the and Bible tells us he met with a lot of people and he, he preached Christ. And he, you know, that's very possible. That's a thousand miles from where Onesimus started. So, if Onesimus got there, he probably did steal money or something, because that would have required a ship passage. Or he stowed away and he owes somebody something or whatever. But he may have stolen from Philemon and just, you know, on foot, he could have gotten to Ephesus or somewhere like that. Who we really don't know, but somewhere he meets up with Paul. Paul, you're you're the kind of the forefather of your faith in the New Testament. Paul was a jailbird. He was in in and out of jail a lot for his faith. Uh, somebody was always locking him up. So you know it was happened several times, and we don't know. I don't even know if we have all of it recorded in Scripture, but. Paul put up with a lot. It was, you know, it was a time when um, the world was not particularly friendly to this new, new faith and these new people. They didn't know what to think of them, these believers. <clears throat> Slaves, this is what historians may tell you, a lot of them believe this, that every third person in that Roman Empire was a slave. Every third person. They, their economy totally existed on slaves. 
they were not like it was in this country. They were from every walk, every land they conquered, they took slaves. Um, they'd be ma male, female, all skin colors, backgrounds, that type of thing. And they were given different roles. Some were nothing more than prostitutes. Some were given hard labor working for the government. Some, usually the Greeks, were expected to have more education and more trainable, so they got the cushier jobs. Many of them helped run businesses for uh, their owners. Some of them um, earned money and trades and then were given freedom after a few years for being faithful. Rome was growing and growing and growing and there were always more slaves. Now the time comes for this book and Rome's not growing so fast anymore. And there would have been a lot of public and governmental pressure not to free slaves. That's where Philemon's at. And in his circles of people that own slaves, what Paul's asking, I think, would have been deeply frowned upon, if not fined and taxed by the government. On the other hand, and I don't understand all of it, but it wouldn't surprise me if Philemon said, I want him executed. The government would have said, no problem. It's consider it done. And they would have taken him and done that. Slaves were beaten. They were tortured. They were executed. All kinds of stuff happened. Running away was a big deal. Um, the Dias Polios. It's a guy you've never heard about. He was a taskmaster in Rome. He served a little earlier than this when Augustus was emperor. Vidalius Vidias, I'm sorry, Polios had a pool in his house full of moray eels that they kept hungry. And I'll let you put two and two together what was happening with slaves that didn't conform. It could get pretty ugly in that culture. I look at Onesimus and I say, he worked for a private citizen. Um, this guy brought a church into his home. I don't know that Philemon mixed with them, but I'm thinking he wouldn't have done that if he was ashamed of the way he was treating his slaves um, as a believer. Paul wants Philemon to go back and face the music, and I'll, I'll read you just a portion of that in a moment. But So I don't know what Onesimus was doing or what he faced exactly. It was kind of a big gamut back then of a little bit of everything. But I'll tell you this. I thought about this in the last few days even. I've never spent one day of my life, one minute of my existence having to say, I'm that guy's property. I, I can't imagine what that would feel like. I just can't imagine I can't even grasp what we do to each other as human beings at times. So do I think this is this terrible, horrible person for wanting freedom for whatever reason? No. But he did break the law. You don't have to turn there. This is some thoughts from Paul. Um, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is, is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one, of, each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And he goes on and talks about slave masters, being kind to slaves. But this is consistent with Paul. Onesimus, you need to go back and face the music. And you see the character and the integrity of Onesimus as a believer that he's willing to do that. And we know that he did that because there's references right in other books that he was there when they delivered the letter um, of Colossians. So, This guy 
whatever his escape was, he's walking right back to the firing squad and hoping that his master understands what Paul said, especially as he is stolen from him. I wonder if he was close to the family and lived in that home and whatnot. He may have had better food than me. He, he may have lived in a bigger home than I'll ever, ever live in. He may have had a lot of things that I don't even have, but he was still a slave. He was still somebody's property. And he may have deeply wounded them emotionally. It may have hurt when he took off. I don't know. It may have been more than just, you know, the fact that it's a, it's a privately owned slave tends, and that he was Greek tends to think he probably had a pretty decent position in, in society. Paul says of Philemon, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening understanding in every good thing we share in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you've refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people and calls him brother. Then, he says, I could order you to do what I want, but I'm counting on you to do this in love and to see Onesimus as I see him. These characters kind of blend into one another, but a lot of what's written about Philemon out there on the internet and in books is about the structure of the letter. It's like a persuasive speech and Paul's trying to get what he wants and he's, he's putting the Philemon on the spot because he's sending him this letter but he expects it to be read to the entire church. Philemon's not just a Christian. He's a Christian leader. I don't agree with all that. I think Paul's much more pure in heart than people are giving him credit for. I think he's just laying his heart on the table. And two things about Paul. Thanking my God, remembering your love, holy people, partnership, deepening, understanding, doing things together for the share of, and the, uh, a share in the sake of Christ. I believe Paul wants that for Onesimus. It's that simple. I believe that Paul wants Onesimus to go back to his old turf and see life differently from a different perspective and to see and be part of and experience the joy of the household of faith instead of being someone's property. And maybe if that happens, he wouldn't even care. But Paul really wants Philemon to, to officially free him. I'm telling you, forgiveness takes strength and it takes courage because when you've been deeply wronged, that's not an easy thing to do, to put that into God's hands and to let go. We are born with desires. If you look at sin back in the garden, everything that Sin is, is taking God-given desires and twisting them. That's what sin is. They had everything they needed in the garden. You can learn a lot from those little passages. And our desire is for justice and fairness. It, it, I just think, think it's God-given. And it troubles us in the world when we don't get that. It just does. It's, it's part. Maybe it's part of... Human nature, though, you know, that twist. I don't like anybody, you know, no one's going to disrespect me and get away with it. Well, it is otherworldly to forgive, and we'll get more into the, all of the foundation behind that next week. I have a neighbor that just brought a bunch of stuff in one day, and we hear all this equipment, and... Uh, I live on a little lake east of town and knocked his own house down. 
And I talked to him, and later on I said, John, what's going on? He said, well, the back wall was buckling. The house was leaning. He said, the outside exterior walls of that home had just been set in the sand. There were no footers. I'm amazed at, I think it was built in the 1940s. How did it last that long? I'm glad they weren't up there and the whole thing just didn't collapse when they were in there. They're the like fourth owners. I mean, it's, obviously it's been there a long time. But you got to have to build on the rock. You said that. They have done that. This clears, they've got foundation here where everybody's on this footing of the cross. And I think it was Aaron talked about that not too long ago, you know. Everything's level at the cross. And they can see each other clearly eye to eye instead of looking down at this slave. And Paul fully understands and expects that. This is what the way I would describe this exchange between Paul and Philemon. I grew up through the Apollo moon missions. Remember those? And, and they were a big deal. My grandfather drove a gas truck, and it was a big gas truck, semi-truck, you know, full of gasoline to places, and, and a marathon. They, they had a ton of these marathon Apollo mission glasses. Anybody old enough to remember those? You fill up and you get a free glass. And it's red, white, and blue, and it's got like Apollo 11 and stuff, you know, inked on the sides of it. Well, do you remember Apollo 13? What a perfect number for that space mission. Everything that could go wrong did. I mean, it is a absolute, in my opinion, one of the greatest testaments to human Ability and again, thinking as a believer, God given minds to get those guys back. I'm just amazed they ever did it. Well, if you watch the movie with Tom Hanks and those guys, th those actors, there's a there's a uh, scene in it where Ed Harris, he's the uh, head of the Houston Control Center. They had to come up with all kinds of ways to save these guys because there was everything on that on the spaceship was breaking down. They were losing, you know, all kinds of things like oxygen. That's pretty important to us. And two guys are standing behind Ed Harris, and one of them is saying, you know, this could be the worst national disaster in modern America. This could go wrong. This could go wrong. This could go wrong. This could go wrong. Ed Harris turns around and says, excuse me, sir. I think this will be our finest hour. And that's the kind of leadership they needed right then. Now that exchange may have well happened. Pretty much. They did a pretty good job with that movie. That's what I get here. I don't think Paul's trying to manipulate Philemon. Paul's saying, it's your time to shine, son. This can be your finest hour. You want to show what Christ is like and his forgiveness for you? I'm sending him right to your doorstep to do that. And yes, I want this proclaimed to the church because I believe in you. That's my take on why he wrote the letter the way he did. We don't have a conclusion in this book. Remember my griping about Jonah? We don't know exactly what happened in the end. We never will. There is a, there was a leader that rose to a great position of leadership in the early church. In Coloss in Colossae, named Onesimus. Not long after this, do I know it's him? No, I don't. I couldn't be sure. I don't think anybody could. But it's. Interesting that that of the timing and the name there. We know that from history. Like Jonah, I believe this book has God written all over it and godly character and godly courage and godly strength. 
It's going to take that for, for Onesimus to walk home and back into that society, let alone back to his, his owner. As nothing's changed yet as we read this for the legalities of, of ownership of Philemon. It's going to take courage, I think, for Philemon to put personal whatever, anger, hurt, ownership aside. A society, like I said, here's, here's the problem with our society. We normalize sin and then, we, then we, when we commit it, we don't think we've done much wrong, right? Um, I'm going to, Kent's not here so I can talk about him and he can't do anything about it. Kent, Kent was telling me once, you know, he used to tell his sons, his older sons, you, you can usually get through Nuego about 10 over the speed limit. Well, he got a ticket one day and Nate said, Dad, they gave you a ticket for going one mile over. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> it's 11 over. That's what that tends to be our our thinking about things. We normalize sin, and slavery was just so normalized in their world. It, it just I, I don't know that as people became believers, they would have given much thought to it. With that, if you have every third person or anything close to that being a slave, you're just gonna think this is the way we do business here. So Paul does not vary from that. I mean, he makes or convinces Onesimus to go back. But he wants the entire situation to be above what the government and Rome would expect. And I'll tell you something about the human heart. You know me, I'm, I'm not much into politics. I, I don't... Um, I finally knew we had a female governor and what her name was during COVID, I think. I, I didn't even, that's me. I pray for our leaders all the time. I'm just not getting, it's a dirty business and I don't get involved in it. But I'll tell you this, no matter where you are in all of that, you cannot legislate the human heart. You cannot. You can make your kid sit down at the table, but if he wants to say, I'm standing up on the inside, he can do it. <laughs> you cannot legislate the human heart, and Paul knows that, and he wants us to be above that. He wants us to be Christ-like and otherworldly instead of, well, this is normal, and yeah, everybody has slaves, and right? Those of you that are parents, was that ever a good reason for you with your kids everybody's doing it we don't really allow it in our homes a lot right everybody's going there well that's not a good reason and Paul realizes that so as we move forward with this book we'll talk about some of those motives that are out wider what does scripture say about why we should forgive and I'll give you a little I don't know what to call it, a little commercial for next week. I have found the hardest person to forgive in life is me. I struggle with that. And I think it probably affected Paul a little bit as well. More than a little bit. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. I believe that that focusing on God for me and forgiving Mark, and, and it wouldn't even be big things. Like, I don't have these deep, dark secrets that would just shock you, but just things that I look back on before I really understood how I should be treating people around me. It's been probably the toughest for me to forgive me. And I'll bring that up a little bit more next week as well. Because next week we have communion, and we're going to have that communion table before the sermon so that we can include more of our people that do the children's church and whatnot. 
And then one last week that I'll tie some of this in, but it's Thanksgiving. Somebody already emailed me and said, that'd be a good week for thanks kind of you know, sermon. I think that's a great idea. So it will all uh, come together through these next couple weeks. This is a great little book. It's amazing how much power can come out of a short letter when God's in it, isn't it? And stirring hearts. Very good. Let's stand together. We'll close. I'll pray. <clears throat> Father, you forgave us when we had nothing to give back. <clears throat> Christ has been called a humble servant. The humble Stoop to help others when they know they're not getting anything in return. It's just a absolute road marker of humility. And he became like us to save us. And I know what a great... I, I don't even know that I could ever calculate the cost of redemption for every person in this room who counts themselves a believer, but I know... It's bigger than anything we ever experience outside of you. Thank you for being that God for us and for loving us in the way you do. In Christ's name we pray, amen.